Hello, I'm Bob the Booker and welcome to my channel. Um, today I wanted to focus in on the Goldsmiths Prize. Um, so recently we had the winner announced of the Goldsmith Prize, uh, Diego Garcia, by Natasha Subramanian and Luke Williams. Um, and this was the tenth winner, so part of me thought I'd already read a fair, fair few of the other winners in the past, why not read the rest? And so I have. <laughs> And so here we are. Um, I wanted to sort of bring together the first 10 winners of the Goldsmiths Prize and sort of have a little look at what they all are like, whether they share any things in common, and just also just really to to celebrate them a little bit more because they're quite fun books. Um, so the Goldsmiths Prize more generally as well, just before I begin, is a prize that intentionally champions innovative fiction. And what they mean by that can obviously vary a fair bit between things. And we've seen from the 10 winners that sometimes that is really blowing up the idea of form and how words are arranged on the page, what they look like, how they interact. Sometimes it can be around subject matter. Sometimes it can be around blurring of genres. So um, how can we explode this idea of literary fiction to include other things how sometimes it, it's about the very notion of how we even think of stories or of fiction so some of these are sort of a bit more blended between um fiction and non-fiction some of them um also play with this idea of what are the things we expect from fiction and how can we subvert all of them so all in all quite exciting really um and so i've got uh, some of the winners physically here um and then a few others that um i've sort of i just don't happen to own but but we'll still sort of talk about so let's get started i'm going to go year by year starting with our very first winner so first up a girl is a half-formed thing by Emma McBride and this book made a really odd kind of splash in its sort of in its first year so it won the goldsmiths it also won the women's prize and it's quite unique really in the sense that we don't often see books that make the women's prize um shortlist also making prize lists like the goldsmiths um it can happen and again actually indeed the next one will have a bit to say about that as well um but you don't often see it in quite the same way you know typically the the, the types of books picked for both of them might be a little bit different um this is a book that was published originally by galley beggar press and the Emma McBride herself had to go around a number of publishers to get it even to be considered to, to you know to, for people to take it up and to get this book out there and I'm so glad that it, it got out there because it, I, I found this absolutely captivating if a very difficult book to read. Um, so essentially the large part of this story is um, a young girl who um, is the victim of uh, some sexual violence and I won't go too too much into that because the, the book kind of unravels a fair bit about it um, and she also has a brother who um, has some form of disability that's not fully pinned down throughout parts of the book um, but that does mean that the world around her and around her brother are laced with people kind of saying the best thing to do or bullying them and, and all these sorts of things and all of that does sound incredibly bleak which at times this book is i mean it's also very funny at times but bleakness is the the, the overriding <laughs> feeling um but the thing that i think is so exciting and inventive about it is how it plays with the sentence as a thing itself. Um, and Emma, Emma McBride in interviews has sort of mentioned that this is something that she was really going for here and, um, and has a sort of a quote from Joyce um, above her writing desk that talks about some of the, these same things as well, about this idea of the sentence being something that can kind of, you know, gives us the ability to say something, but also can imprison certain ideas within grammatical constructs. And so she really plays with that. Um, where sometimes there are words that are broken up midway through um there are sentences that are very sort of staccato almost because they're broken up um so even uh let's just pick one at random let's see um okay here we go um oh god light running through the room i know it's supposed to be and burn no shine this is not for me turn quiet in the morning through the house i'm caught where the light comes where the sun comes in twist and it, it goes like this and it's very very difficult to read and I, I found it a bit challenging at first and then listened to the audiobook for it which actually i think cleared up a lot of what was going on here for me instead because hearing Emma mcbride do it 
um, really worked. And actually, this book, the brokenness of this language is kind of part of this point, because as we go through increasingly in the book, there are parts where she's slightly more lucid and parts where she's even less lucid. And when it hits some of those bits where she's less lucid, you kind of see why. And it's, I think this is just so masterfully handled and it's such a fantastic, fantastic book. Um, I loved it. It's incredibly dark, incredibly difficult and challenging to read, but in many ways, such a perfect first winner of the Goldsmiths Prize. And as I mentioned, we don't normally see books win both the Women's Prize and the Goldsmiths Prize, but somehow in the first two years of the Goldsmiths Prize, that's exactly what happened. Um, and Ali Smith's How To Be Both, um, a really intriguing book in so, so many ways, um, won both. Um, and here, in terms of where it sits within the Goldsmiths Prize, it's fun to see... I mean, Ali Smith feels like a perfect fit for something like the Goldsmiths Prize anyway. Um, an incredibly sort of clever and driven author, but also very playful and experimental with form. Um, and um, How To Be Both, uh, in as the, the title suggests, splits this book in two ways. Um, so there is a former sort of older historical period going on where we learn um, about a woman um, and her her sort of struggles to be understood and to stand out within within certain worlds particularly around art and particularly to have her um, her selfhood recognized and we have a more modern day version where there is a woman who is a young woman who's sort of searching and finds out a bit more about this older figure um, and what was really fun and intriguing about this book is the way that Ali Smith did this as well um, in terms of half you know half the books that went out had the older part first and then the the newer part second sort of chronologically and the other half of the books were shipped the other way around so that you would experience the first you know quite, quite, well it throws into question what the first and second half of a book really is um, and so immediately playing with form and playing with function and this idea of how to how you know what is chronology and actually just because one thing goes first doesn't mean we need it um, I believe the version I read was the past first and then the current age but it's also quite fun to read the idea of you know somebody learning loads about this woman of the, in the past and about the history of art and then going back into that world um as well but a really a really fun book it was also shortlisted for the booker it just it was a, a very you know given ali smith is already an author who's produced a lot of high quality books this was one of those sort of special gems of something really quite that kind of just seemed to strike a nerve in a good way across a lot and a lot of people um and really fun to see this on the goldsmiths that within the first two years we have these two women writers with excellent um uh, really groundbreaking books and how they approach this idea of what fiction can be um, one in terms of breaking language itself one in terms of breaking the expectations of a novel next um, in 2015 we have Beetlebone by Kevin Barry um, and this book plays with the idea of a, a sort of an Im fictionalized imagined John Lennon um, who is wandering through life <laughs> and in many ways sort of has this this sort of trip that he is taking um, and it's really quite a bizarre book in many many ways this is uh, I suppose falls into that part of the goldsmiths um, prize where we often see books that are just wonderfully weird um and this john lennon figure is trying to get to an island he's trying to get to these other places and he's trying to to move through the world and we get this very um it's very dialogue heavy in a way where this almost feels like we're off stage watching some characters argue so for example some pages uh, let's find a good example are just sort of like this of just text of a conversation um, which makes it incredibly easy and quick to read actually um but it's again also very very funny in, a, in amongst some sort of darker themes um you've got characters arguing in this sort of ridiculous uh, sort of brogue almost all the way through the book it's so silly and combative and yeah it's I, I as much as i didn't always fully get on with this i did really enjoy the process um of it of just um characters constantly arguing and never really being fully sure what's real what's not real um and indeed there's a lot that isn't real seemingly in parts of this book which is kind of the fun of it of trying to unpick you know obviously we're, we're starting with this idea of a fictionalized john lennon at a very serious point of his life um and it's all a kind of wonderful haze to, to read 
Next up, 2016, we have Solar Bones by Mike McCormack, um, a book that also went on to be on a few other prizes, including the Republic of Consciousness, was also long listed for the booker, and um, is just a really, uh, yeah, again, I mean, all of these books have a wonderful weirdness to them, so saying that they're weird is not a, a negative necessarily. Um, the whole book is one sentence, um, and I get that that is off-putting for many people. It is kind of broken up on the page as if they are in sentences. So it still has sort of line breaks. Um, and actually, weirdly, the sentence thing never feels like an issue in this book for you, I, at least for at least I found. Um, I mean, this is someone who loved Duck's New Report, on which more later. Um, but the, the line breaks actually do make this quite um, doable because you can, you can sort of follow it and, and kind of hear how these, this very, again, dialogue heavy, very conversational book um, plays around with so many of these ideas. Um, interesting to see how many of these um, authors so far as well have been Irish, because uh, I think the Irish playfulness, like I Irish literature as a whole, and this is a wide generalization, has been incredibly inventive with form um, and with language. And I think Solar Bones really fits within that legacy of, um, there's such a playfulness in this about the way that language is used to capture certain concepts and ideas. Um, and sometimes, it is through this sort of repetition that we have pages where we circle back to something, circle back, oh gosh, that feels really corporate, where we come back to um, something that was said right at the beginning of the book or an idea that was expressed earlier, this kind of cyclical, uh, very conversational, very kind of almost uh, claustrophobic uh, bit of language. Um, and it all kind of loops back round. Um, but all of this really at the heart of it is telling the story of a man um, trying to reconnect with parts of his family and there are various things that are getting in the way of him being a father and feeling like a, a proper husband um, and there are some twists which are also really uh, spoiled by the back of this book so <laughs> word of caution pick up the book but maybe don't look at the the blurb um, I think it's kind of hinted at in, in the book but there's a big twist that I think it's better to, to kind of to experience um, but yeah, a really gorgeous book, and I think I just found this so compulsively readable, and just that the, there's a rhythm that is built up from that one sentence that just keeps going and, and is really so entrancing, I think. Next, we have 2017 with Happy by Nicola Barker. And again, you'll notice right from the beginning that we're about to play with words and language in quite a big way. Not only from this A being in a different colour and being in brackets, same for Nicola and Barker, they're, here, they're down there as well. Um, but also, if you have a casual flick through the book, you will occasionally start see start seeing things like where, like things in giant bits of text or uh, where is it there might, yeah some blank some blank pages with just a couple of words on them or where's my favorite bit okay so i can't find it exactly hang on um you've got a cathedral made out of words uh it, just lots of things that already on the page are um really quite stunning and particularly at the beginning of the book you have um certain i'm not sure how clear this will be on the camera you have certain words that are in different colors and at first you don't really know the rhyme or logic to that, um, but then you start being told what they are, um, that essentially we have a character who is trapped within some kind of modern day system. I say trapped, it's kind of a, a difficult thing because he's happy, you know, everything's good. But any words that are loaded with some kind of danger, with emotion or with other things like that, that maybe are a threat to this sort of system holding them all in place, for better or for worse, are coloured a certain way. And our character starts to realise at various points in the book that the colours of words are changing for certain things as he finds out more. And so we think, okay, maybe um, this word is no longer dangerous, or maybe this word is only dangerous when he considers it within this context. Um, and then what follows really in this very readable book I think I've, I, I found is it starts really breaking down and we get pages like this where words and rhythms and, and everything just break. Um, we get other words, I found it again just a moment ago, where things change and blur and blow up again. And in many ways, this book, I think, is such a perfect encapsulation of what um, innovative fiction can be in that it really plays with this idea of how how does the page and how do the words on it tell the story that we want to tell? It's often not just, I'm going to tell you what's happening or I'm going to help you imagine it. Sometimes it is actually, in in this world, words break down for this character, like in A Girl is a Half-Formed Thing, 
language no longer is able to do the thing that is needed um, for the characters to be able to articulate what it is they're feeling. And so all we can do is start to break that language in half. Um, and that's exactly what I think Nicola Barker does so well here. And I really want to read more of hers because I kind of just get the feeling I'd love her as an author. I, I've, there's a one of her books that was shortlisted for the Booker that I've been meaning to read for the longest time. Um, it's about 800 pages, which has been often the thing that's slowing me down. But I'm really excited to read it now following this. In 2018, we have The Long Take by Robin Robertson. And this is, again, a, a really fun addition to this list. Um, it is in many ways a novel told in verse or in some kind of thing like that. Um, he, Robin Robertson, is also a poet, I believe, and um, this takes this idea of a kind of noir novel about the experiences of war, and it tells it through this sort of poetic form. And so in many ways, again, breaks this idea of what is a novel. Um, can a novel be told outside of prose? And if so, what are the things then that make up a novel? Because normally, you know, we might see, for example, a collection of poetry as being very distinct from a novel. But if that collection of poetry is one long poem, can we consider it a novel? Can it fit within those confines? And again, it really blurs the line. So I, I sort of see again where this this sits in the the long line of, of the goldsmiths in terms of challenging this very idea of what a novel is. If you think of something like Ulysses um, by James Joyce, the, there are passages of that told as a as a play, um, which is actually also happens in Beetle Bones. Um, and you've just got things that sort of break this idea of what a book or a novel can be. And the long take then takes you through these really quite profound and heartbreaking moments of these um, these characters trying to navigate a world sort of pre and post war, um, really gutsy and, and a bit of a gut punch at times as well. Um, was also shortlisted for the Booker, and I think maybe that speaks to this sort of wide appeal that this book can have of being really quite hard to pin down, but also there's a, there's a route into it. We can read this as as a very poetic novel, um, or we can read it as as a long poem or, or what have you. But regardless, we're sort of brought into this rather bizarre and dark world. And the one you knew that I would be very excited to talk about, Duck's New Report by Lucy Ellman. And here this breaks the idea of a novel in a very weird way and also sort of really probably, you know, broke a fair few delivery boxes because of just how huge it is. It's a thousand pages. It's mostly one sentence um, with some bits that are kind of that cut in the middle and break it up a bit. And on the surface, it sort of sounds like it's not really going to go anywhere because it's mostly the inner thoughts of um, a woman as she is making pies. Um, and that doesn't sound like she's going to have a, a large number of adventures through those pies. Um, and it's inter interspersed with stories of um, a sort of a wild cat that has escaped. And again, none of this really sounds like it should make sense. Um, I found it really weirdly moving. Um, and here's why. So this one sentence is is packed with this idea of uh, of this repeated um, sentence, the fact that, or the you know phrase, the fact that. And she is musing on various things as she goes. So the fact that um, that that when people say this, they really mean this. The fact that blah blah blah. And they build. And what sort of happens as a result is not only do you get lured into the rhythm of this book. But she starts to build these arguments in much the same way as I was um, I was saying with some of these other books, particularly um, something like uh, Solar Bones, um, which sort of builds rhythms and patterns that then come back later. Duck's Newburyport does that in such a big way. And obviously with, with being a thousand pages, there's a bit more room to run with that. And those sentences and rhythms start to really build. And not only the, the rhythm of the fact that, but you start to see other things coming back where she makes a joke about the country name Djibouti um, and then comes back to that joke 200 pages later and then another 60 pages after that or, or whatever, you know. And so by the, by the end of the book, you have this sort of collective knowledge almost of these jokes, these patterns, these rhymes, these sort of things that are all coming together and they kind of rise into this one huge thing. Um, and uh, it's just a wonderfully weird book, and I love it. 
um, there are parts um, around 700, 800 pages in where there's suddenly an injection of some action because something quite menacing happens. And it, it's really fascinating to see how the pattern built within the book speeds up or contracts or gets broken or all those things because of this moment happening and then can even back out to where it was before. Um, and there's something really engaging about that. I just thought this was such an interesting book that as much as it's a bit of a beast and it's huge, is really quite powerful. And I, again, found quite moving in parts, which it doesn't sound like it should have been. Uh, maybe I was just broken down by, you know, a thousand pages of one sentence, but regardless. And, uh, you know, the second time as well, the Galley Beggar Press wins this prize. Um, so they're doing something very right, I think. Um, but yeah, a fantastic, fantastic book and one I love um, deeply. And that brings us into the 2020s. So in 2020, we had, um, ooh, where have I put it? Uh, the Sunken Land Begins to Rise Again uh, by M. John Harrison. And I was very lucky to go to an event um, where I heard him and the next winner, um, Isabel Weidner, in conversation, talking about the Goldsmith Prize and about their books and, and various other things. And what, one thing M. John Harrison said um, about his own book within this is, you know, despite him having formerly been seen uh, as somebody who's more of a genre writer, he writes a lot more sort of science fiction and fantasy. This book in some ways was a bit of an attempt to play around with some of those genres and, and play around with things, but also to do kind of what I was saying earlier in terms of subverting the very idea of our expectations around fiction. So he intentionally has a lot of things in this book that aren't particularly plot driven. Um, he intentionally creates sort of small things growing in the background in almost kind of a way that reminds me a little bit of um, uh, of Waiting for Godot, where the idea, the, 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 the result is not you're not wait, wait, well, you are waiting for Godot to arrive, but the point is not Godot arriving. It's watching things slowly change in the background. Um, it's sort of subverting those expectations. And in many ways that sort of happens here. We have some rising sea levels and we have some other things, sort of other bits of tension rising in the book, but ultimately it's not particularly resolved in a huge way. And that's also not really the point. Um, and so we've got these two characters who are sort of a, kind of dating at times and sort of kind of not. Um, as they sort of navigate this world. So Lee Shaw is one of them and, oh, who's the other? Victoria. And they are basically sort of living these parallel lives, which in many ways don't really intersect and there isn't much happening that, um, you know, at times it almost feels like they're ignoring each other. One of them will give an update and Victoria will just carry on with what she was gonna say anyway. And so there's this sort of weird parallel where actually, again, we don't have this idea of, things going as we're expecting them to the kind of idea this is going to sound sound suddenly very technical but but go with me here there's a, a linguistic um theory right called grice's maxims which is based on the idea of, of by by a man called grice uh, surname is grice i can't remember his first name um and maxims of conversation are around the idea that we have certain expectations with the conversation so if i say um hello you might say hello back if i say how are you you would respond and then maybe ask me how i am and you know those conversation patterns that we follow. And in many ways, this book starts to break those down, um, at least that I found, um, in a way that then maybe also subverts our other expectations around a plot um, and um, and what we might expect next, that we expect there's gonna be a beginning, middle and an end, there'll be some rising tension followed by some resolution, all those things. And actually none of that really happens. And maybe that's a commentary too on the kind of political landscape because this book deals with Brexit and various other things. And maybe the point is that these things are not neatly resolved within the space of a book, um, which is fun anyway. I may have over analyzed this I thought it was an interesting book um, and a very fun um, and engaging winner as well. And second to last, so our most recent winner before this year's uh, Sterling Carrot Gold by Isabel Weidner. And uh, long-term subscribers may know, I adore this book. I think it's really fun. Um, and I think Isabel Weidner is just one of the most exciting writers we've got um, writing in English at the moment. I don't always fully love their books, in like or, or fully get their books, I should say, but I'm just really excited by what's happening regardless. Um, so Sterling Carrot Gold plays with ideas of um, of kind of state surveillance and kind of state power versus the individual. Um, it plays with the idea of language, of gender, with various other things. Um, and in many ways, I think I've described it before um, as being, it, it feels like 
a kind of queer hand grenade thrown at the idea of what a novel could be. It blows up so many things that we might expect. There are bits that are non-linear, there are things that don't really fully seem to make sense uh, at first. Um, it's at times very conversational and we have characters sort of chatting between themselves and then we suddenly go to these high high blown academic concepts. Um, it's very exciting and, and bizarre, but we essentially are following these characters as they go through a sort of Kafka, the trial like um, sort of situation where they are standing up against sort of state persecution. Um, but also everything's quite dreamlike. And is it real? Is it not real? We have a protagonist who's looking for their father um, and their father may or may not be sort of linked in some ways to Justin Fashnu, the, the first openly gay footballer in the UK. And so again, this starts speaking to this idea of sexuality and gender and and state suppression of those things and particularly state suppression around um, being a foreigner and, and what, whatever else. And it's really fun. <laughs> it's just, I really want to reread it because I just think Isabel Weidner is so exciting and this is such an, a, a book full of ideas um, that I think are really well executed and really just engaging. I did, again didn't always fully get where I was going with it, I just loved the ride um, and I think it's just, yeah, it's very very exciting and this again feels within the sort of the, the long list of the former winners of the Goldsmiths Prize, this feel, feels kind of right. Um, if, but, but if you look at all of them together, it's really interesting because both M. John Harrison and Isabel Weidner in this, in this talk I went to spoke about how often innovative or experimental fiction is seen as just being a book, you know, a story told normally, but oh, it's a bit quirky, you know, like maybe it's written in run on sentences, maybe it does some fun things on the page, you know, and, um, and kind of how sometimes that blurs the lines of actually there is some other deeper um, work going on to really experiment with the idea of fiction and to really innovate. And actually this is where I think this book does something really quite special in just being quite out there in how it addresses and approaches the very idea of, of telling a story as well. And last but not least, we come to this year's winner, Diego Garcia by Natasha Subramanian and Luke Williams. Um, so not only does uh, this immediately sort of scream to you that this book might be innovating by the fact that it has two authors, um, and therefore it might throw up the idea of who tells what part of the story, how do two writers come together, do they write each word together, do they write their own bits and stitch them together, is it somewhere in between the two of those things? All of those things. And as much as I didn't always fully get on with this book, um, even though it was chosen clearly for the win by the, the dog teeth marks there um, from a dog I was looking after, who essentially picked the winner without me realising I should have put money on it. I should just go to him with the book along list next year and be like, buddy, go for it. <laughs> Chew whichever book you think is going to win. Um, but ideally not the library books because I need to give those back. Um, <laughs> like uh, This book um, is about so so many things um but predominantly a key part that it's trying to reconcile and um, with at the heart is this um this area of land these these Ch uh, chagos or chagos i'm not entirely sure how to pronounce it um islands um which have sort of passed between various owners as it were um particularly britain in the us um it having been taken by the british um and then later turned into a sort of naval military base thing um and in the meantime you know, sort of dispossessing, uh, is that the word? Move, moving people out of its, uh, you know, there were lots of people who were moved forcibly often from the land. Um, and this book deals with that as a political concern. And there are passages, for example, this book itself, that the, the, the narrative within the book is also told by two people, um, which again throws it up this idea of how much is the, the dual authorship here mirroring um, it, within the book, how much is that mirroring the, the real life creation or how much is that just sort of a bit of a, a meta joke thrown in there. Um, but there's a passage in the middle that's a transcript of an interview with um, a woman who was moved. Um, then there are other people within the book who have various opinions. There's one person who's named Diego after one of these islands and we have this whole kind of narrative around power and the state and um, particularly kind of things like colonialism and empire and how all of these things interconnect. And so this book deals with a lot of really quite big conversations, but does so 
often through quite a, an interesting and sort of personalized version. It's not just, pardon me, it's not just that these characters are kind of espousing thoughts on these. These are these are characters that are living um, within it, and it then sort of will play up bits of the the text. It starts playing with the idea of translating certain words and not translating words. They're written in sort of sections that can feel at times almost like you're reading nonfiction. Sometimes that you're reading fiction, and again, really blurs those lines and those distinctions between those two things. Ultimately, that takes us really to the end where we have all of these books, when I pick them all back up, um, all of these books that I've got here and four others um, that are just really interesting pioneers within how we can play around with fiction and with words and with stories to do something new. And it, in many ways, that's quite exciting because, you know, the, the novel as a concept or as a form has existed for so, so many years. And actually there's still so much innovation in terms of how we can play around with it. Um, you know, if you think about sort of experimental or innovative fiction in the past, so many of the things that they did then are done now, but these books are maybe still interesting insights into how we can still keep blowing up this very, uh, this very notion of what a novel or what telling a story might look like. Anyway, I've been Bud the Booker, reading the Goldsmiths uh, Prize winners from the last 10 years. I hope you've enjoyed and uh, speak to you all soon. Take care. Bye-bye.